Hello. Um, if you're watching this, you're probably someone like me um, who's been affected in some way by ALS. Maybe you're a patient, newly diagnosed. Uh, maybe you're just trying to figure out the state of research because you're worried about it, or you're a family member who's, whose parent or sister or brother has recently been diagnosed, or maybe you're a caregiver um, just trying to learn more. Um, but whoever you are, uh, welcome. I'm glad you found me um, wherever this video exists. Um, I'm someone who has been really directly affected by ALS. My, my mom um, was diagnosed uh, in December of last year um, and subsequently has lost the ability to walk, to speak, to breathe, um, to smile um, or eat. Um, so she's totally locked in now. She can move her head a very little bit um, and she can move her eyes slowly. Um, so, you know, even in that short time, this year where we've really been dealing with this every day, I've learned a ton super quickly. Um, and I wanted to put together a set of videos that could act as a sort of survival guide of sorts, um, set of really specific tips and tricks that I've, I've come to know because unfortunately it's a, it's a real skill set navigating the healthcare system, you know, taking care of someone who's, who's really sick, who needs a lot, um, who's feeling a lot. Um, and maintaining, um, you know, a healthy state of mind in the face of all that. It's really difficult and none of us are prepared for it by our day-to-day -day lives and then you get thrown into it suddenly. Um, so yeah, that, that was sort of my, my reasoning is I wanted to make the videos I wish I, wish I could have watched a year ago. Um, and I also just wanted to, you know, vaguely like offer myself and my, my skills, you know, I'm gonna, I'm sure these won't be like super widely viewed or anything, but I'm going to include my email. If you, if you need anything, if you want to reach out, um, get specific advice on medical equipment, you know, um, vet people, uh, whatever insurance companies, um, I'm, I'm there and I hope you, you know, I hope these serve to make you feel a little bit less alone. Um, because again, that's something I, I, I wish I had had at the beginning. And um, I think it's, it, it could be um, valuable. I think the internet can, can serve us in this way. Um, yeah, I guess uh, this video, I'm not gonna get super into detail on, on anything specific. I just wanted to kind of introduce myself, um, introduce what I'm thinking for the series so that if you you watching this before I'm done You can offer some feedback or if you just want a really specific skill you can watch this and go to that video and Then give you kind of a, a history and an overview of ALS itself um, the state of the science um, And and what to expect a little bit just as far as symptom progression um, as you as you move forward So my name is Cooper Penner. I live in Los Angeles. It's really sunny outside right now um, It's 2019 I study neuroscience, actually. I work at Cedar sinai which is a hospital in LA, um, in a cognitive neuroscience lab. But I sit only, you know, a couple doors away from my mom's neurologist. Um, and I studied neuroscience in, in college. I was specifically part of this program um, at Brown called Contemplative Study. So I was studying the neuroscience of meditation. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about those questions. Um, and I mentioned my background just to say that I do have some access to the medical systems, you know, I'm, I'm really, uh, I have access to those people and an, an insider look to a certain extent. And I, I can parse through the sort of like, um, you know, uh, complex language of scientific literature and, and, and understand it a little bit and hopefully share some of that. Um, I should also say that my mom's form of ALS is genetic in nature. It's, um, I'll get to that in just a second, but she has this um, repeat sequence, C9 or F72 repeat sequence, um, which is a particularly nasty type of ALS to get. Um, and so there's a 50% chance that I also will develop symptoms um, or a little bit less than 50%, 50% chance that I'll get the gene and, you know, depending on who you ask, an 80, 90% chance that I'll develop symptoms. Um, so I, I really do think about this a lot. I live with it every day. If you're experiencing that as well, we can talk about it. There's a whole host of questions I never thought I'd have to consider. You know, I've always wanted kids. I now don't know if I'll ever have kids or get married or if I should pursue my, my dreams, you know, go after my secondary education as a doctor or researcher. These things have, have really come up for me. So, um, 
I've got <laughs> I've got a lot of skin in the game, so to speak. Um, yeah, that's I guess about all all about me. If you have any questions, you can just leave a comment or something, and I'll I'll answer it as well as I can. ALS itself has obviously been around for a long time and has been pretty well documented um, for almost two centuries now. Most people um, believe that this researcher named like Jean Martin Charcot, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, um, discovered ALS. He was actually more of like a synthesizer of the research. So that was in 1865. About four decades before him, some people had started to really um, get into this disease and, and describe it. Um, and, and describe the pathology, uh, including some sort of like potential, what could later be seen as genetic factors. Like there's this really great paper from 1850 on this sea captain. It's not a great paper. It's horrible and sad, but um, who, you know, his whole family got ALS, which at the time was this abnormality, but now we can see, you know, probably he was an early C9 patient or an SOD1 patient, something like that. So it's been around for a while. Um, it's quite rare. As of now, there's around 30,000 cases in the US, um, 6,000 new cases each year, about one in 100,000, two in 100,000 people will get it um, in Western European populations. In East Asia, which is where we also have a lot of data, it's rarer. It's about 0.8 in 100,000 people. And except for like, these really strange specific cases in Western Guam, and this um, peninsula called the Key Peninsula in Japan. Uh, where it's way more common and no one's really sure why it could have something to do with algal blooms it could have something to do with um this specific cyanobacteria that lives in the roots um als itself is a disease of the upper and lower motor neurons um, which is just to say motor neurons in your spinal cord and motor neurons in your brain um and it can manifest in a whole host of different ways seven this is again any anytime i give you a percentage it's coming from a you know all the papers I've read but there's very little agreement on anything so you know I've, everything with a grain of salt but 60 to 70 percent of cases start with um, you know uh, disease in the limbs disease in the legs um, 30 to 40 percent start with um, bulb or onset which is to say the tongue so a loss of ability to speak but there's no specificity it can it can happen in all sorts of ways some people can walk perfectly well but can't really move their hands some people can move everything but can't really speak at all some people stop being able to breathe really quickly. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff flying around saying like, okay, if it starts in your legs, that's better. If it starts in your arms, that be that's better. Maybe one day that will prove to be true, but I'm very suspicious of those claims. So, you know, even if you've gotten it and someone has said, that's the worst place you can get it, you know, there's there's no telling what will happen. There's no telling how quickly or slowly your disease will progress. And that's, that's scary, but... Um, it could also be good news for you, you know? There might there might be, it might go really, really slowly, you know? My mom went super fast, but some people live with the disease for over, you know, decades and decades and decades. Um, some people live with the disease for a decade without really progressing that much. So no one knows a lot about why things happen or, or why they happen at the speed they do, um, but there's, there's no way to really tell ahead of time. The other aspect of ALS, which is not as discussed or well understood is the concurrence of um, dementia symptoms, frontotemporal dementia. So again, depending on what you read, some people say 5% of ALS patients, some people say 50% of ALS patients. In, in the case of what my mom has, what I may one day get, C9, I've had a doctor say 100% of patients end up getting dementia symptoms. Um, although that's probably a little bit, you know, a little bit spookier than it needs to be. It's probably more like 80, 70%. But that's just to say that it is it is quite common and it's difficult sometimes to parse that out because the person might not be able to speak as well and they're going through a huge life change. So there's, a, you know, a lot of depression, a lot of things are coming up. So if they're acting emotionally different, it might not just because, you know, their, their frontal cortex is thinning out. Um, from my own experience of this, I was really convinced my mom had dementia symptoms early on. Um, acted very strange especially before we'd gotten her trach which is an invasive tube you, you you get a surgery you put it in your throat if you lose the ability to breathe um and some als patients opt to get that to con to to continue their life my mom did um uh i i was really convinced that she had uh dementia and she she 
doesn't. Like, I'm, I'm sure she doesn't now. It was just what was going on then and her not getting enough air and being panicked. But she was emotionally very different, you know, very angry. Um, and that was just what was coming up for her. And, you know, I had people say horrible things. They were like, you know, just everyone was convinced she had dementia. Um, even me. And I'm really, I really try to be, I'm a pretty, like, even-keeled dude. Um, so, you know, even when you hear that, don't, don't necessarily jump there. And even if your loved one or, or the person you're taking care of does have dementia, I think that there's this huge stigma against mental illnesses, like, because it's associated with the end of life, people sort of consider it like this, this early death or something. But the person is still there. They're just changed a little bit. You know, they're just, they're a little bit more emotional, potentially. They remember things a little bit more poorly. So it could be difficult for you, you know, as someone who's known and loved someone your whole life. But I really, it's been very helpful for me to, to or was helpful for me um, in thinking about it at the time when I was convinced my mom had dementia symptoms to just think of them as the same person but changed a little bit you know getting to know getting to know a person in a new way um and trying to not you know insulate yourself from them and from that um but yeah that is it is something to come up and it is something to consider also as you as you make decisions moving forward or if you're a patient consider that 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 may that may change for you um and the effect it could have on on the people around you and the people who love you um I went over how common it is. Um, so most ALS is is what's called sporadic ALS, which means that no one really knows what uh, what causes it. The kind of like what most people think about now is that, like with many diseases, it's a bunch of factors coexisting. You know, there's this six point factor theory that's out there right now, where six different things that give you like slightly up your chances come together for a perfect storm so maybe you started smoking at a very young age which there's evidence that that's associated with als maybe you've had a bunch of head injuries it's associated with als you know maybe you live in this weird part of the world where there's cyanobacteria in the tree roots um and maybe you have a gene that's not well defined but does up your chances a little bit you know it's it ups them by five or ten percent all those things come together and you get als generally around age 55 that's the average um, so, you know, that's, that's why sporadic versus familial is a little bit misleading because in all likelihood, there is a genetic component to your ALS. It's just not well understood yet. You know, we're kind of looking for needles in the haystack. Luckily, because of the huge amounts of data we have and new tools, those factors are, are getting parsed out really quickly. And there's a lot of great work being done on mega databases with huge amounts of data. Hopefully it'll, it'll work out. Um, other than that, there are four big diseases or four big genes that while they're not purely like Mendelian, which is to say they're just passed on, um, you know, from, from father to daughter, uh, or, or mother to daughter, um, they're, they're kind of like that, like in all, like, like for, for example, in our family, C9, my mother has dementia. I mean, my mother has ALS. Um, her mother got dementia, which is the other thing you can get from just pure C9, and my great-grandfather got ALS. So there is this really direct, you know, passing on. The four genes like that are C9 or F72, which I've mentioned already a bunch of times, SOD1, FUS, oh god, what's the last one? I have this written. Uh, and TRADBP. Um, good news is if you're a C9 patient or an SOD1 patient, there's some really exciting new therapies coming out. Um, anti-sense approaches to the disease that have shown some great preliminary results. So you are the luckiest of the unlucky. Um, there's probably also more genes, I should just say. Um, you know, there's this sort of chronic problem with undersampling in, in mega, mega gene studies, in, um, where a lot of this data comes from Western Europe, America, and East Asia, and probably the people being sampled um, are, are mostly uh, white. Um, you know, that's a classic thing in Alzheimer's with the APOE4 gene, which everyone was very excited about. It's much less of a risk factor for, for black people. So there's probably a lot of stuff we don't know just because of intrinsic biases in the system and undersampling. Um, 
that point is, I guess, neither here nor there, but it's just to say that a lot more will probably come out, and I think the genetic component of this disease will continue to grow and expand, and within our lifetime, I, I believe, um, will sort of be woven into a tapestry that, that will allow us to um, meaningfully approach approach this disease. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's a pretty good you know, over, overlook. There's one thing that people don't expect a lot from ALS, I should say also, is um, pain. My mom experiences a lot of pain, which is pretty horrible. Um, some people don't, some people do, but that's just something to be aware of is, is the um, potential pain. So the last thing I'm gonna do in the video is just really quickly go over my plan um, moving forward. The next video I was gonna do is on just super basic caregiving um so you know what food do you buy because there's some real crap out there um getting a stair lift getting a good bed doing transfers um feeding keeping a medical journal stuff like that um then i was going to talk about healers i guess i like <laughs> probably doesn't need to be its own video but i i have a lot to say about that because it's very surprising that when you get into when you're in a super vulnerable state people come and, and try to take advantage to a certain extent without even really thinking about it in those terms. Um, but they just, if I had a nickel for every time someone said that they could cure ALS with, you know, quantum neurology or seaweed or whatever, um, I would have like 40 nickels. <laughs> so, you know, there is a lot to be gained from people outside of the medical industry because the medical industry and our understanding is really limited has a lot of flaws um so i'm not saying like don't do that stuff but there's a there is a strategy to to moving through the people who will inevitably show up in your life i was going to do a video on caregivers um because you're about to start um a really important relationship if you're a caregiver and uh if you're someone who's looking into this and just getting started it will end up being a super important relationship in your life and potentially a difference between it being a positive or not positive experience um, I was going to do one on insurance companies, um, because they're evil <laughs> and they'll get you and you got to be careful. Um, there's a lot of things to consider. I would say now, and I don't, I don't say this to, to scare you. If you're watching this video and, um, you're pretty sure you have ALS and I don't mean like your arm is hurting or something, but like you've been to a lot of doctors, they don't know what's going on you should, and, and it's getting worse, you should consider getting life insurance. Um, we did that, it made a big difference. Um, you should get it before you have a pre-existing condition because they will not in insure you, um, which is horrific, but just the truth. So just super upfront about that. Um, yeah, I'm gonna do one on maintaining sanity and, and staying with yourself and, and being okay in the face of this, um, which is different for everyone, but just kind of the journey of your life changing and, and ways to interact with that as a caregiver. Um, and then I was gonna do a video on tough decisions and I'm not sure I'm gonna do this video, but just end of life conversations, um, doctor assisted suicide where it's legal, what the ins and outs of that are, getting a trach versus not getting a trach, financial realities of of ALS potentially and interacting with that um, strategies for dealing with it and just kind of like my you know the basic talking points that we went through um, because there are very serious conversations that we all have inevitably in our life eventually our lives end and it's complicated and, and messy and a total shit show um, oh no I can't curse whatever um, But yeah, um, and then maybe a video also just on C9, if you're, if you're a, a C9 patient, um, really getting into it because I know a lot about that, that science, obviously, because I, I read about it, <laughs> like, I'm obsessively reading about it all the time. Um, so yeah, that, that'll be less, less for the Hulk community and more just for individuals who think they could be suffering from that. Yeah, so that about covers it. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you found this. I hope I can offer you some help 
and I hope wherever you are, you're taking care of yourself um, and enjoying your day. Okay, thank you so much.